Oh, hallelujah. One word. Come on, somebody. Man, I had to go clean myself up after worship. Let's stand together. If you have your Bibles, if you would, open with me to the book of Ephesians. I want to go to the third chapter, Ephesians chapter number three. Good morning. Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? Amen. I wish I could hear Bozier. I know they're shouting over there. I want to welcome all that are watching our live stream today. Um, we've got folk all over Texas, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Indiana, Virginia, North Carolina, Illinois, Ohio, California, the Middle East, and our Bozier campus. So can we give all those places a shout out this morning? Amen. Blessed to be where you are today. We're in part three, if you're taking notes of paying attention. If you haven't been paying attention, we're in part three, all right? We're going to begin today in Ephesians chapter number three. We're going to read verses 20 and 21. Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. If you're there, just say amen. amen. Now unto him that is able. We just got through singing about how he is able. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. We know that's true because this was penned 2,000 plus years ago and here we still are glorifying Jesus in the church. Amen. World without end. That meant it would go all the way from where it started at the Sea of Galilee to Shreveport and Bossier, Louisiana. Amen. World without end. And then somebody on the back row said, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And I ask right now, Father, that by your spirit, we would receive wisdom and that you would give us spiritual understanding of your word a conviction of truth. We ask you for words of hope, faith, and salvation. And I ask, Father, that you would speak through me words you would have spoken. Override what I said at the 8 a.m. service and what I've studied and premeditated. May your Holy Spirit speak by me in this moment, and may your word be on my tongue. And I ask, according to Psalm 45, 1, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word that removes our burdens and destroys our yokes forever. As we boldly declare that Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet two or three people around you. Make them feel welcome this morning, all right? We can't have nobody leaving tonight. Nobody spoke to me at church today. Now, if you would, just tell your neighbor, let's get into it. We're in part three of paying attention, and if you weren't paying attention, there's five things that we've covered in the last couple of weeks that cost us based on where we're placing our attention, and I want you to write those five things down. We cover them in part one, so this is just a little brief review. Too much new material to get into today to do much of a review. So here's the five things that I believe, based on God's Word and just life, that we pay based on where we put our attention, what we set our minds on. Number one, we pay time. Time. Where I'm placing my attention, I'm eating up time. Number two, I am paying with money. Where I put my attention is costly when it comes to our finances. Number three, I pay attention with my health. My health is affected by what I give attention. That's my physical health. Mental health, spiritual health, emotional health. Number four, where we place our attention will cost us in our relationships. Our relationships pay for where we put our attention. And last but not least, number five, we pay in our potential. And I'm concerned that so much potential is being lost in today's society based on where we're putting our attention and social media is certainly a corporate of that. And we spend hours a day scrolling other folks' lives, missing what God has for ours. Can you say amen? amen. So today, we're going we're gonna to deal with some things that I hope will be a blessing to you. I want to back up here to verse number 20 of Ephesians 3. 
where we, we read before the prayer. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. If, you, if you're one that writes in your Bibles, emphasize the words ask and think. Above all that we ask or think. So God is saying here that our thoughts are the platform of his performance. That he will do exceeding abundantly above what I ask or think. And notice because this proves something we've been dealing with quite a bit lately, not just in our Sunday services, but in our Wednesday services. And by the way, Wednesday is just a repeat of Sunday. I mean, not a repeat, but it's the same thing. We worship and get in the Word, all right? So if you, you want to make our Wednesday service, it, it, it's, it's Bible study, but just, just like you would experience on Sunday, Wednesday is the same thing, except we go over because there's no second and third service. Amen. So notice the words ask or think. That that's my confession, ask. That's my meditation, think. God says, I will do exceeding abundantly above what you ask or think. What you ask or think. And my asking or my confession is going to always be the result of what I'm thinking. Scripture backs this up. Romans 10.10 says, with the heart man believes, but with the mouth confession is made. So there's this relationship, this marriage between my mind and my mouth that's all over Scripture. Jesus in Matthew 12, beginning in verse 35, said out of the abundance of the heart, that's where the mouth speaks. And there is this pattern in life that what I meditate on tends to lead to what I speak, and what I speak becomes what I do. So the order is, I think, I speak, and I act. I think, I speak, and I act. If you want to change the way you act, you've got to change the way you think. Can you say amen? amen. Now let's back up, if you would, to Proverbs, or go over to Proverbs, the 23rd chapter. Proverbs chapter number 23. And I, I, I've quoted this verse, but I want you to see it. Proverbs 23 and we'll look at it down in verse number seven. It does matter what gets my attention. There are too many that don't believe it matters. I've had people argue with me through the years that, well, you know, just because I say something don't mean anything. It means everything. There is a relationship between your heart and your mouth, and what I'm saying is the result of what I'm thinking, and inevitably what I do is going to be the result of what I've said and what I have thought. And so we'll explain that here in just a few minutes. But I want to add weight to... What's getting my attention? What am I sitting around thinking about? And we're really going to deal with this, Lord willing, in volume four of these series when we get into pulling down strongholds. Now, Lord willing, next week we're going to talk about addressing the issues. We'll deal with expectations and insecurities and just, again, these battles we face in the mind. But we'll end this series of teachings, Lord willing, with volume four called Pulling Down Strongholds. And all a stronghold is... It is a perception or a thought that I have in my mind that I seek to defend. I want to support it. I, I, want, I, want to, I want to pull things out of my life experience that support this perception that I have. But every thought we have is not necessarily right. And every thought doesn't need to be supported. And I'll give you an example of this, which would be prejudice or racism. And if you grew up with a prejudice or a racist mindset, that you judge somebody by the color of their skin, where you go ahead and, and complete somebody just because of what they look like or the color of their skin, if, 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 you, if you do that, then that, that becomes a stronghold. And that stronghold is looking for support. That stronghold is looking for, hey, let me find something to prove that it's real, that black people are a certain way or white people are a certain way. And so you might ignore everything that's going on in your life and around you because that doesn't support this perception that you've had. You're only looking for something that supports that ideology that you have. So you might see a hundred things that would disprove that, but you only hold on to the one thing that helps make that case. Anybody understand what I'm saying to you? That's a stronghold. And you can have strongholds in life and in community. You can have strongholds in relationships. You can have strongholds about preachers. You can have strongholds about churches. Ain't right, Mr. Tim. You can have all kinds of strongholds. You can have strongholds about people that work at car dealerships. Tim, I wasn't talking about you, man. 
You might have a stronghold about referees. Oh, let me get in here close to you. I'm all in your business, man. You better give me something. You know that's right, right? Love you, man. Love you too, love it's rough being a referee, in. It and you know, and you're going tomorrow night. We're praying for you, man. Three, there's three teams on that court. The two teams playing, and the ones that got the stripes. All right, then. But if you already have a preconceived idea that refs get the calls wrong and they're biased against you, then you only look at the calls that didn't go your way and you ignore all the right calls. Am I saying it right, Tim? He said, I'm saying it right. That's a stronghold. And I'm jumping way ahead, but that's what we're going to deal with in volume four, strongholds. I need to recognize, wait a minute, is this a stronghold that I have in my life that needs to come down according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10? Do I have a thought that really needs to leave my life because it's become my confession? It's, it's, it's dictating how I live and how I act? It, it, it's setting up rule over me. It's bondage, and we can be free by truth because just because I perceive it to be true doesn't mean it is true. But the truth will make you free. All right, where y'all at? Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23. Look at this in verse 7. If you're there, say amen. amen. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you would, read that with me out loud. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I become the product of my thought life. I become the product of my thought life. Will you tell your neighbor that? I become the product of my thought life. Now, Proverbs 4, verse 23 backs this up. It says that out of the heart flows the issues of life. That if you don't want something in your life, don't let it in your heart. Why? Because the life, my life, is always seeking to finish the image I put in my heart. So whatever image I have in my heart, good or bad, I'm looking for my life to complete that image. So I can you have a, 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 a victim mindset that nothing ever works for me. And even when good things happen, it wasn't supposed to happen. So I got the job, but I go home and say, well, I, I doubt they're going to keep me. I don't want to get my hopes up, you know. How many times do we hear people say, don't get your hopes up? Because that's likely somebody that's been let down, that has a victim mindset. Nothing good ever comes my way. Don't get your hope up. And you come home and after you got the good job, talking about, oh, you know, I'm going to get too happy. I might not keep it. You know, they probably going to let me off. And then you get laid off. What do you do? You brag about, I told you. <laughs> because our mind is seeking to finish the image. Whatever image we put in it, we're seeking to finish the image. That's why we can't put the wrong images in because you'll look for that image and, 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 and it, it might cost you in other areas because you're looking for this one image to manifest in your life. So what I'm giving my attention is so important. It dictates the health of my whole life. Now, Proverbs 23, 7 here says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he, I become the product of my thought life. Now, with that in mind, go back with me to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. I got 30 minutes left. We're going to get all this out in Jesus' name. Go with me to Genesis 11. I feel like an attorney today making a case. <laughs> then I got to convince you what you've been thinking about matters. And what you're setting in front of you matters. What you spend time giving your attention matters. Because you're not just giving it your attention, you're paying for it. It's costing you in time, money, health, relationships, and potential. So is this worth my investment? Is this really worth my investment? What is coming out of this thing that's getting my attention? And sometimes it can just be a thought. I heard an old preacher say a long time ago, he said, you might not be able to stop the birds from flying around your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. That's good, eh? Wish I could take the credit for it. It wasn't mine. Genesis 11, when you get there, say amen. Verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they've got this confession of what they're going to do. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see. Ooh, read that part out loud, Shreveport Bozier. 
and the Lord came down to see. One more time. And the Lord came down to see. He came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. It looks like at this point it's been built. But as we're getting ready to see, it has not been built. It has only been built in their imagination. It has not manifested completely yet. So we'll look at it in verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they, what? Begin to do. Oh, read that out loud. And this they began to do. So they had not done it. So how did the Lord come down and see what hadn't been done yet? He saw it in their heart. He saw it in their mind. When I was a little boy, both of my grandmothers on mama, daddy, mama and daddy's side were both believers. I always had the worn Bible by the bed or by their chair. My, mama, my mama's mama would send us to the mailbox with tithes and offerings to send to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And when she died, they went through a checkbook and that's where she put all her money, Billy Graham got to get, as he's preaching crusades back in the day. My grandmother on my daddy's side lived in Murfreesboro, Arkansas. I always had a worn Bible right there. And when she died, I went to her funeral, and a little boy went to the funeral. And when I came home from the funeral, I'll never forget this. I said, I got to start living right because grandma's in heaven, and she's watching me. I remember thinking that, that, man, I got to get my act together. And every time I go to do wrong, you know, like do my sister wrong, I think, man, grandma's watching. I got to get this right. I didn't have a fear of God, but I had a fear of grandmother, and I knew she was there. And it kind of bothered me a long time, man. I just felt like Grandma was everywhere. I go to my room to go to sleep. I'm like, Grandma, are you watching? I mean, I, just, I always thought Grandma was watching. And I knew she loved the Lord. And I was like, she's in heaven for sure. She can see everything. But do you know God, 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 not only sees everything and knows everything that we do, we're going to look in the Word. He knows what's in my heart. He knows the images I have in my heart. He knows the vision that I have in my heart. And I feel like the reason so many of us are wrestling with anxiety and fear and we're not mentally healthy is because we're allowing an image to be painted on our heart that God cannot endorse. We are giving to God and ourselves a vision are a blueprint that's not in line with what he wants built. And when I give God a blueprint for my life and that blueprint's not in line with his will, he doesn't have to send the cement and the two before us and the brick and the mortar and the tile. He doesn't have to send the resources to bring that building to pass when my vision is wrong. Did that make sense? I need the right image. I need the right blueprint if I'm expecting God to bring the right resources because there's a relationship between vision and provision because all provision is is the endorsement of vision. When we first were given an opportunity to go on KSLA television, I know we're on other stations and the local ones, so I didn't mean to bring up KSLA, but that's where we were first, all right? And we're not going to edit this out just because we're on KTBS. We love all of you, all right? But when we first went on, we needed this piece of equipment it, it, it was before the digital age, and it would take the, 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 the footage from cameras and put it on a beta tape. And it was big and very expensive. And a used one was like $13,000. Now, back then, it might have been $13 million, because we didn't have $13,000. But we had to have it to do this thing right. And I'm, I'm wrestling with, man, are we supposed to go on TV? We got enough money to pay for the airtime, because, you know, no pay, no play. So wherever you're watching this tele telecast right now, somebody's paying for you to get to see this. So, th so thank God for the people that give so we can reach so many people. But, 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 but I'm, I'm struggling, right? And I remember walking around my living room like, Lord, you know, without this piece of equipment, we can't go any further. And I get a phone call from a very dear friend of mine named Brother Steve. And he calls me up and he said, Lord, put you on my heart, Brother Jane. He said, how's the television ministry going? I said, Brother Steve, right now we're doing this. He said, well, what do you need? And I'm like, oh, how do you, you hear my prayers? What's going on? What do you mean? What do I need? I said, well, we need right now $13,000 to buy this piece. No, I didn't tell him. I said, we need a piece of equipment. He said, how much is it? I said, 13 He said, I'll bring it to you tomorrow. So, vision, provision. Say it out loud. Vision, provision. When we get a vision that's in line where God wants you to go for your life, for your family, for your home, for your business, for ministry. When you get a vision in your heart that God says, oh, I'm for that. Now you got the right image. Let me back that up with some provision. 
when we first had a chance to go on international television, I think it was World Harvest Television, where we could reach the whole world through, through cable satellite TV and, and the, the price tag. I'm like, oh, oh, man, Lord, I, you know, I can, cannot believe you for this. And we had a dear member named Dr. Harris. She's in heaven now. And, and I told the church we had an opportunity to go on uh, 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 international television. And, and it came with a price tag. She showed up the next day. Didn't say take up an offer. Didn't say who can give. She showed up the next day and she said, I'm committing myself to one year of that broadcast. One person paid for the whole year. I'm like, well, I got to sign the contract. God must want us to do it. Vision, provision. Does it always fall just that simple? <laughs> I wish it did, Lord. That made it easy. But God has shown me time and time again that when he's for a vision, he brings provision. But yeah, we walk around oppressed, depressed, in a mess, and can't rest, trying to pass yet another test and all that other mess. What's going on? Perhaps the reason we don't have wholeness in our life is because our mind is set on the wrong thing and God can't give me peace. Isaiah 26 says that the mind that is stayed on him is a mind of perfect peace. I need to recognize that I'll never have peace with you if I don't have peace with him. And I'll never have peace within until I have peace with him. But you know what we do? I'm, I'll blame you that I don't have peace. But the reason I don't have peace with you is because I don't have peace with me. So I'm walking out my own image toward you. And the reason I don't have peace in here is because I don't have peace with him. I've let something get my attention and I've developed an image or a thought or a perception that's not in line with his word that he can't endorse and I'm struggling because my mind's not right. I got to get my mind right. It does matter what's in your heart. Keep reading. What verse are we in? All right, watch this. So the Lord came down to see. Verse five. Verse six. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. Ooh, you got to watch this next statement. And this they began to do. Read it out loud, Shreveport Bolger. And this they began to do. They hadn't done it yet. It wasn't finished yet. They had only just gotten started. Read it again. And this they began to do. Watch this. And now nothing. And now nothing will be restrained from them. Read the rest, which they have imagined to do. They've got the image down. Now nothing will stop them because the image is real. God came down to see what they had imagined. Go as quick as you can to 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I want to show you something in verse number 9. 1 Chronicles, Old Testament. Look at your neighbor and make sure they're not in Corinthians. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. So when the Lord came down at Babel or Babel, it was to see what they had imagined to do. And notice how he stopped it. It's interesting how he stopped it because he stopped it when he confused their languages which proves the next step after meditation is confession. So he interrupted the process in between the imagination and the confession. But I want to show you how important this is. In these next two verses we're going to look at, uh, we're going to use 1 Chronicles 28 and then Ezekiel, and we'll be done. And young will be some grilled chicken. But watch this in verse 9. If you're there, say amen. amen. And thou Solomon, my son, Know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. Serve the Lord with, with your heart right. Serve the Lord with your heart right. My heart has to be right. We've been worried about the outside of the cup, not the inside of the cup. We look good. Y'all look good today. There was a couple who looked so good at the 8 o'clock service, I sat down next to them. They were seated right over there. Man, they look sharp. I said, man, y'all look sharp. I went in and sat with them. They look so good. Made me look good. <laughs> so if I sat next to you here, man, it's because you just look good. 
All right, just kidding. Watch this. What good is it me looking good on the outside if the inside is messed up? So David tells his son Solomon, get your heart right. Serve the Lord with a perfect and pure heart and have a willing mind. Now, why? Look, look at the why in verse 9. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Now, beginning with for the Lord, let's read that part out loud. Ready? Read. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. So stop right there. God is checking out my heart. He's looking to see what images I have on my heart. Heart check. Searching my imagination. He says, if thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now watch verse 10 because this is crucial where we're going. Take heed now. Mm. Read that out loud. Take heed now. You know what he just said? Pay attention now. The word heed means attention. Take attention. Pay attention. Take heed. Pay heed. Take heed. Give attention now. Why? For the Lord hath chosen thee to build. Now, I know it says a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. But let's just stop. Let's, 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 baby steps. For the Lord hath chosen thee to build. Let's read that out loud. For the Lord hath chosen thee to build. So Alex, the Lord wants to build something in you. The Lord hath chosen thee to build. So there's something he wants to build in your life. As a man, as a, as a husband, as a future father, as a, as a, as a minister and so on. The Lord hath he, there's something he wants to build. And it's not because he is in full-time ministry. The Lord hath chosen thee to build. And no matter what, what walk of life you're in, the Lord has something he wants to build. Everybody has a purpose. Amen. But notice he said, he said, number one in verse nine, you've got to get your heart right, Solomon. You've got to get the imaginations of your heart right. God is looking at the imagination of your heart. Why? Because he has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Now, with this in mind, go as fast as you can to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43. And you'll see why it's so important when you get there. Ezekiel 43. So, David tells his son Solomon, get your heart right. Get your imaginations right. God wants to build something in you. But he can't build with the wrong set of blueprints. Can I say something? You know what most of us think we need? Money. Let's just be real. Most of us think money will solve the whole problem. But it won't. I'm going to tell you why. Money is just an amplifier. Whatever you already are, money will amplify so if you drink like a fish, <laughs> money will make you drink like a whale. <laughs> and the only reason you ain't killed yourself drinking yet is because your friends don't have that much. Because you go on your friend's house and y'all pop a can. I ain't trying to mess nobody. I'm being real. And it could be anything else. And don't, don't get mad at me because I brought up one thing. The point is, is that money just amplifies what I already am. Whatever I am right now, money will amplify it. If I love shoes right now, money will get me more of them. Hey! If, 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 you're, if you love hunting, money will just help you to hunt in, 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 in more places. Wow, there might be a lot of hunters in here. Y'all got real quiet. So you, you, get, you get what I'm saying? Money just amplifies. So money in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It just amplifies. But what if what is currently in my life is not something God wants amplified? It's not anything he wants to develop. Then he's got to hold off the provision and the resources until my heart gets right and then...
funnel the resources to me because I have the right blueprint. We're taking to God the wrong blueprint and then asking him to build the house. Ezekiel 43, if you're there, say amen. Verse 10. Oh, this is good. This is one of my favorite verses. I love this verse. Watch this, verse 10. Son of man, talking to Ezekiel, thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel. Show the house to the house of Israel. Read that out loud. Show the house to the house of Israel. I want the house of Israel to see the house that I drew. What God is doing here is he's, he's asking Ezekiel to confront Israel with what they had built and to judge what they had built by what he had drawn. Mm. Okay, let me, let me use an illustration. So let's say you built a house or you're building a house and you got a bedroom that says 18 by 18. I just pulled that number out of there. And you went in the house, and they started framing up the walls. Don't look at the house when there's no framing, because you, you think the house is too small. It, it gets bigger when they start closing it in. And, and we built this church. I was like, oh, it's too small. Well, actually, it was. But anyway, when they put the walls up, it gets bigger. So you look at the room, and you say, this room is small. This room can't be an 18 by 18. So you get your tape measure out, and it's 16 by 16. You with me? So then you go get the blueprints, and you look at the blueprint, and you say, no, the blueprint says 18 by 18, and then, then what they built was a 16 by 16. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to call the contractor. And you say, you built this room too small. This is an 18 by 18 room that you built 16 by 16. You understand what I'm saying to you? Well, we're supposed to build based on the blueprint. God said, Ezekiel, I need you to take the blueprint that I gave you. For the house of Israel to build and let them see what I design compared to what they built. Let's, let's finish the verse and you'll see it. Verse 10. He says, son of, uh, son of man, show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. Oh, read that part out loud. And let them measure the pattern. What's the pattern? The blueprint, the drawing. Show them what they built compared to what I designed. And they got to figure out, why didn't we build what he designed? Got distracted, built my own thing, got out of focus, ignored the Lord, didn't get in his word, got on social media and built my house based on that instead of the word. Are oh, you hear what I'm saying to you? There are a lot of people today that aren't living out the purpose that God has for their life. Why? They got a different set of drawings. They got distracted. They got away from the original blueprint. We've got to get back to his word so that we can build the right imagery, so that we can have the right hope and the right mindset. Because when the mind is not right, the house will not be right. In other words, I can build out something that was not in line with his will. God said... Ezekiel, go, go show the house of Israel the house I drew. And let them look at the two. This is the one I drew. This is the one you do. Now look how they don't line up. Get your house in line. Isn't that what Jesus said when he talked about the two men, the wise and the foolish? He said the wise man heard the word, did the word, and he built his house on a rock. Rain came, wind blew, house stayed still because he heard and did the word. Other guy heard but didn't do the word, built his house on sand. Rain came, wind blew, house fell down. Why? One did the book, the other didn't do the book. It's the message from the Old Testament to the New. Are we building a life? Are we building a home? Are we building out based on his word? Because when we don't, that's when things fall. That's when things don't work. That's when we don't have peace. That's when we're cutting each other's throat because we built something that was never in line with God's word. We built on our image. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. My challenge to you today is to say, okay, Lord, what did you call me to build?
See, and I'm closing, but watch, watch in verse 10. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel. So what if, what, what, what if I said, show the house to the house of Hobbes? You see what I'm saying? What if I said, show the house to the house of, and I know you're not married and have children yet, but, but future house of Euler. Show the house to the house. What are you building that I never gave a blueprint for? And could we not be experiencing wholeness in mind, body, and spirit and finances all because we're giving God a blueprint of something he never wanted built? And what could happen if we, what could happen if we gave him a blueprint? of something he actually wanted. Because it doesn't matter what man says can never be. It doesn't man, matter what man says would never work. When you give God a blueprint of something he wants, and I believe this ministry is a perfect example because I know from the very beginning I had all these folk tell me you'd never see white and black folk worship together, but you look around the room because anytime there's a blueprint of what God wants, he'll always make it happen. It doesn't matter what man says. It doesn't matter how you're attacked. It doesn't matter what the enemy's doing. Our God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all all that we ask or think when we give him the right image. Am I missing peace? Because I got the wrong image painted. pray with you. Every head bowed just for a moment. Process it right now in your own mind. What are you paying attention? What are you giving time? Money? How is it costing you and your relationships? Your health? your potential. Because I'm here to tell you, if we get our attention right, God can bless us in all those five areas. He can bless us in our time. We become efficient and effective. He can bless us financially. He can bless us in our health. If you think there's something to be afraid of, if you're anxious about something, that that's your perception, it doesn't matter if it's not real. It only matters if it's real to you. And when we go into this fight or flight mode in our minds, our brain communicates to our bodies, we're in a fight. And then we start holding up our blood and our near our vital organs and even our blood pressure changes because our mind says in a fight, we gotta protect what's vital. But you're not in a fight, but your mind thinks you're in one. And our health is affected. Our blood pressure is affected. Our minds are affected. Fatigue sets in because we stay in this fight or flight mindset. Then we get sick. You can't think that you're thinking doesn't affect your health. It affects everything. We get into a fight or flight mindset with people in our in our life, in our relationships. All because of our perception. 
Our potential is lost. God had so much he wanted you to do today, but you wasted today. This week, but it was wasted. This might wait year, years go by. Potential wasted. And it's costing us. Where we're putting our minds is costing us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, may your Holy Spirit give us a conviction that goes beyond anything a man or woman or human could ever say. And Father, I ask by your spirit that you say what I didn't say and couldn't say. And that you show us in our hearts how to apply this word, your word to our lives. And help us to build images and thoughts and visions that are in line with your will. That will experience your peace and your provision and live out healthy lives, healthy homes, healthy churches, healthy communities because our hearts got right. Help us to see when we judge someone that our heart isn't right. Help us to capture sin in our heart before it comes out of our mouth, before we act out on it. Show it to us in our heart when there's hate there, when there's lust there, when there's jealousy there, when there's anger there. Help us to catch it in our heart and not allow it to remain. May we be like Solomon and the words David by you gave him that we serve you with a perfect heart. In Jesus' name, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I've seen in your word that where I place my attention matters. So I ask right now that you would show me the areas of my heart that need to change. Things I've planted that need to be uprooted. Strongholds I've built that need to come down. I ask right now that by your Holy Spirit, you would do a work in me. I believe Jesus died for my sins and he gives me salvation and purpose and I ask that your purpose for my life be fulfilled and that beginning in this moment you would help me to draw to imagine the right blueprint for my life that my house would look like the house you ordained for my life in Jesus name amen would you clap for the Lord if that helped you this morning? I sure hope that helps somebody. Let's stand together on either campus. If you need prayer, just come forward. One of our altar ministers will be glad to pray with you. Otherwise, you can be dismissed. I love you guys. Have a blessed week. See you here Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. Invite somebody to church with you. If you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, I love you. Have